Hey friends, welcome to Compass Online. My name is Jana Dukes and I am the worship pastor at our Whedon campus. I wanted to personally invite you to come out to one of our Easter services where we will learn how we can have new life and abundant life through Christ. At Whedon, we have been focusing on how our lives should be worshiped to God. In Genesis 1, 27 through 29, we learn God's original plan for mankind. In these three verses, God did three things. He blessed us, He gave us purpose, He told us to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and govern it. And lastly, He provided for us. He gave us what we needed to do what He called us to do. So I encourage you to think about this. What has God blessed you with? Your family, your job, your business. And then second, pray and ask God for wisdom on how you can ensure that what He has given you is fruitful. And He will answer you because His grace is made perfect in our weakness. Let's worship God together.
fun is this, huh? Oh, the toys that pastors get to play with. Hey, welcome to the Compass Church, everybody, and welcome back to our series called Deconstruction, A Doubter's Journey. I wanted to say hi to all of our friends who are joining us online, always thinking of you and grateful for you. I want to say hi to everybody at our Bolingbrook campus, the Three Rivers folks and the South Naperville campus, Naperville and Wheaton. So grateful and uh, just really appreciative that you're diving into this study of deconstruction, the, the struggle when faith that was once strong seems to be eroding and our confidence and our enthusiasm. Deconstruction, it's an important topic. Today, I, I want to talk at first about bouncing balls. I, when I was a kid, I used to love Super Balls, and some of them just seemed to bounce so high. I used to kind of experiment to see which ball would bounce the highest. And being that I've got toys that I didn't have then, let's do a little experiment, shall we? All right, here we go. All right, friends, the first ball we're gonna try is the tennis ball. Uh, let's see how it goes. Mm, that was interesting. Uh, how about the racquetball long lost sport? Don't see as much racquetball these days, but here we go. Ah, nice, bouncy, very nice. How about baseball? We've got the start of the Major League Baseball season, baseball! Wow, that was disappointing, I expected more. Speaking of disappointing, let's talk about the Cubs, shall we? I got a special Cubs baseball, and speaking of bounce back, we need the Cubs to bounce back this season. Let's see if this bounce tells us anything about the Cubs' future. Are you kidding me? No! Forget that whole analogy, that's not gonna work. Uh, next, I, I have the NASA made moon ball. My son let me borrow his moon ball. Designed by NASA for maximum bounce. Let's see how she does. Wow, that was impressive, nice. Well, if, if NASA's uh, got a lot of funds to design a good bounce, the only industry I know that has more funds is golf. A bunch of country club rich guys willing to pay countless millions to get a ball that will go the farthest possible. Let's see how golf does. Woo, holy cow, it outbounced NASA. How about that? Interesting, let's talk. Well, friends, that was interesting. The, the golf ball won the show. Are you surprised by that? Friends, let's, let's talk physics, shall we? Uh, in physics, they describe the bounciness of a ball as the coefficient of restitution of that material. Isn't that interesting? And one of the things that they note is that it never bounces back to the same height that it started. In fact, the higher the coefficient of restitution, the greater percentage of the distance dropped will it regain when it bounces. And again, it's impossible for it to actually go higher than what it started unless you've got a magic ball. Friends, are you ready for this? Let me show you. This red ball is magic. Watch this. I'm going to hold it and drop it from this height. What? How in the world do you explain that? Friends, do you, do you know? Well, I'll tell you the answer to the secret. It's not really a ball, it's a balloon. And you say, yeah, but how do you explain that? Well, I'm gonna pop it. And inside of the balloon, I've got a piece of a racquetball. You can snap this piece of racquetball that, uh, you know, cocks it, makes it almost like a spring that when you hit the ground, how about that, huh? Tricky. 
Well, friends, this magic ball, the capacity to bounce back, actually higher than you've ever been. That's what we need to talk about. Because this bouncing ball stuff has to do with the trajectory of our spiritual lives. Think about it. A lot of times people spiritually, before they're a Christian, their life is going downhill. But eventually they trust in Jesus and he changes everything and it starts going up, up, up. But deconstruction, which we've been studying together, is when spiritually doubts cause us to come down, down, down again. Here's the question we're asking today. Is there life beyond deconstruction? Is there a capacity to bounce back and maybe even higher than you've ever been before? That's what we're going for. And friends, we have good news. We're going to learn from Peter, who went through a very difficult deconstruction journey, that in the grace of Jesus Christ, there is power for your spiritual life to bounce back. The coefficient of restitution, if you will. Because of Christ, it's sky high. In fact, you are not at the end if you're deconstructing. In fact, your spiritual life can bounce back to heights you've never enjoyed before. In fact, that's the goal of Christ. That's what he longs to happen in your life. So let's continue, shall we? In week four of this series called Deconstruction, a doubter's journey. <laughs> How about that? I could do that all day. Friends, let me uh, clarify something, all right? That magic ball that bounces higher than it was dropped from, well, Again, it's because of this, I call it an engine, uh, gives it the power. And I just want to clarify that Jesus is the power within us that enables us to bounce spiritually, bounce back. And so this yearning for life beyond deconstruction, there's only hope of that level of growth because of the Lord within. All right. And let's study how the Lord worked in Peter's life. Friends, I want to go back and start by reading a verse we already looked at last week. Can we? It's John 21, verse 9. It says, when they got their boat to shore, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish and bread, cooking over a charcoal fire. Do you remember that? After the miraculous catch, Jesus made breakfast for these disciples. And there's a detail there that I didn't point out, but I need to today. And that is a charcoal fire. Charcoal fire. Why is that so significant? One thing you should know, that nowhere in the New Testament is a fire specified to be a charcoal fire. Nowhere in the New Testament except back in John 18, a few verses earlier. Let me read that reference to the charcoal fire. It says, the servants and guards stood around a charcoal fire, warming themselves, and Peter stood with them, warming himself. And so Peter had already been around a charcoal fire on the night, in fact, at the moment when he denied Christ. Remember the three times Peter was asked, do you know Jesus? Are you one of his disciples? Three times, as Christ had prophesied, Peter said, I don't even know the guy. In fact, Mark tells us that he swore in his impassioned denial of even knowing Jesus. The denial, the failure, was around a charcoal fire. Jesus brings Peter back to a charcoal fire. What is Christ trying to do? You say, wait a minute, wasn't the breakfast a tender expression of love? Absolutely. But it was also a firm reminder to Peter of his great failure. In fact, let me read verse 14. It says, this was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. Right there at this breakfast, John reminds us that this is the third time Jesus has appeared to Peter. The first two times, I should tell you, the 
They were both back in Jerusalem. The breakfast is on the Sea of Galilee. The first two appearances were back in Jerusalem in this rented room. The first appearance was the night of the resurrection, Easter evening. The second appearance was a week later on the Sunday that followed. Those two appearances, Peter had been there. And he had not addressed the matter of his colossal failure, his denial. And Jesus is saying, dude, are we going to talk about the elephant in the room or not? I don't know exactly what Peter was thinking. Let's, let's just guess, shall we? Maybe Peter was saying, maybe Jesus doesn't know that I denied him three times. Kind of a foolish assumption being that Christ knows all, and Peter knew Christ knows all, but maybe he was hoping somehow Jesus was just oblivious to how badly I blew it. Or maybe Peter was saying, you know, let's just let her slide, enough time will pass, and Christ will forget about it. You know, we do that sometimes, don't we? Oh, let's just pretend that never happened, and hopefully some time passes, and God will forget that it happened. Or maybe Peter was minimizing it, saying, you know what, it was a bad night, you know, we all have our bad nights, it's not that big of a deal. Maybe Jesus doesn't even think it's worthy of a discussion. (laughs) Friends, the temptation to ignore, deny, minimize failure is very real for all of us, and it's very real for Peter, but it's always the wrong path. The right path is to address our failure directly with the Lord. And Jesus is giving Peter ample time to bring it up, to seek forgiveness, to address and to reconcile. But Peter is chickening out. Even the charcoal fire, which you know made Peter think of his denial. Jesus is like, good breakfast. Anything we should talk about? Peter says nothing. And so Christ has to work further to get Peter to speak on it. Here's what he says, verse 15. After breakfast, Jesus asked Peter, Simon, son of John, I should pause. That's like saying Jeffrey Todd Griffin. You know, when my mother used my full name, I knew I was in trouble. So when Jesus says Simon, son of John, that's his formal name. And you know, you better listen, Peter, because this is important. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Well, what is Jesus asking? Peter, I got a question for you. Do you really love me more than these guys? You know, they're sitting around the breakfast fire. Jesus addresses Peter in a way that got everybody listening. And he says, Peter, is it true that you really love me more than everybody else? What's with the more than everybody else? Well, here's what's up with it. On the night that Peter denied Christ, before the denial itself, remember Jesus had said, before the the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Well, it turns out that at that moment where Jesus predicted his denial, The context was that Jesus had said to all the disciples, you're going to desert me tonight in my greatest hour of need. And Peter had said, I will not. These guys may desert you, but I will never desert you. And then Jesus said, yeah, actually, you're going to deny me three times and then the rooster will crow. Well, it's, it's that affirmation that Peter made, and you can read about that in Mark 14. It's that affirmation that they may deny you, but I never will. In other words, my love for you, my devotion to you, Jesus, exceeds even the other disciples. And so when Jesus then asks around the breakfast, so do you really, you really love me, huh? More than these guys? He was bringing Peter back to his Bold statements of devotion that never came to fruition. Does Peter say, all right, all right, I know what we need to talk about. No, he doesn't. I will tell you what Peter says in verse 15. He says, yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I do love you. Now, to Peter's credit, he didn't say, yes, Lord, I do love you more than these guys. 
He's been humbled a bit. He realizes that his statement of superior love was out of line. And though Jesus asked him, do you love me more than these guys? He didn't say more than them. He just said, I do love you. I appreciate his humility. Let, let me show you what Jesus says in response. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Feed my lambs. Well, you need to understand that that's a spiritual analogy. Jesus used well, animal analogies quite a bit. Originally, when he called Peter, he had said, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. Rather than fishing for fish, now you'll fish to help people who are far from God come into God's boat, get right with the Lord. He used fish analogies. Now he's using shepherding analogy. He's saying, Peter, feed my lambs. Uh, a shepherd. In fact, pastor, the term pastor literally means shepherd. It's one of the analogies used in the Old Testament as well as the New. That people need to be committed to taking care of the flock of sheep that is God's people. And so he's saying, Peter, I am calling you anew to the care, spiritual care of people, God's people. Get back in the people business. You recall, Peter had gone back to fishing. Peter had viewed himself as disqualified, that he had messed up so bad that the previous vision of Jesus to use Peter, in fact, Jesus had said, Peter, you're rock. The name Peter means rock. You're the rock on which I'm going to build my church. In other words, you're going to be the leader of this church I'm forming. Peter's like, yeah, well, I blew that. Jesus had high aspirations to use me, but my failure has disqualified me, and so I might as well go back to fishing. And when Jesus says, take care of my sheep, buddy, he's calling him back. He's reinstating him. He's saying, I still am going to use you to spiritually care for people. Don't go back to fishing. Well, there's more. In, in verse 16, it says, Jesus repeated the question. Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter's like, yes, Lord. Peter said, you know that I love you. Well, then take care of my sheep. This is weird. Peter had to think it was weird. He's like, you just asked me if I love you, and I said yes, and then you told me to care for your sheep. You ask me again, I say yes again, and you tell me to care for your sheep again. It's like, why are we doing this twice? Well, it's not twice. It's three times. Let's take a look. Verse 17 says, A third time Jesus asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Third time he's asking. Jesus is trying so hard to bring Peter back to the failure, right? He denied him three times. He's asking him, tell me, do you really love me? Three times. And finally, Peter gets it. It says in the second part of verse 17, Peter was grieved when Jesus asked the question a third time. Peter's like, oh, 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 I see what you're doing there. Christ made the charcoal fire to try to get him to talk about it. He wouldn't do it. Christ had asked him, so you really love me more than these guys? Bringing him back to the bold statement he didn't follow through with. Peter didn't bring it up. So Jesus asks him, do you love me? Three times. And finally, Peter is deeply grieved. He realizes, oh, <laughs> I see what you're doing. You want to talk about it, don't you? And Jesus is like, yeah, man, I want you to talk about it. And Peter is able to emotionally go there and look at his failure. But then he quickly realizes, but this three-time thing is not only bringing me back to my threefold failure, it's also like a mulligan, like a do-over. Jesus is asking me, I'm giving you a chance here, Peter, to affirm me three times after you've denied me three times. And the grace of Jesus is seen. And not only is he bringing up the failure, but he's giving Peter a chance to say, no, I don't, that's not true. That's not how I want to live. That's not who I want to be. Thank you, Lord, for giving me a do-over and letting me affirm 
my love for you three times. And so I believe with resolution, Peter says in verse 17, yes, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. And then Jesus said, feed my sheep. When he says, you know everything, I I love that. Uh, Rather than appealing to his words, because he's already proven that his words can mean nothing, Peter appeals to Jesus' omniscience, Jesus' capacity to look into his heart. And he says, Jesus, you know everything. You know I really do love you. Isn't that beautiful? And so the grace of of Jesus is being displayed. He's not bringing up the failure because he wants Peter to just wallow in it. He's bringing up the failure so that we can be forgiven of it and move on. The moving on is seen in this, uh, or one, a chance for Peter to again say, I love you, I love you, I love you. A redo, if you will. But also, three times the Lord says, feed my sheep. The, the repetition of the, the reinstatement just brings emphasis. To, this, that's, it's not like Jesus is saying, all right, Peter, you can, I'll let you back into feeding my sheep. No, he's saying, Peter, you're the shepherd. You're the shepherd. You're the shepherd. Three times in the Bible, repetition means emphasis. He's believing in Peter saying, don't go back to fishing. I'm calling you, my friend, to spiritual care for the sheep. Do it. And Peter said, amen. Let's do it. And so in this strange, repetitious conversation that Peter is having with Jesus, it's it's showing us that the path is not to deny our failure to look away, to sweep it under the carpet, to hope God forgets. No, address your failure and to your surprise, find the grace of God saying, I forgive you. I'll give you a redo. I will reinstate you to the calling, the mission that I had given you before your failure. This is so important for us. Some people think that God gives people a mission, that God uses perfect people. He does not use perfect people. In fact, the calling on our lives, God's calling to us to have a life that makes a difference for eternity in the lives of people. The calling of God is not because of our past performance, but in spite of our past performance. It's important for us to know that. As you look at your life and say, could God use me to impact people spiritually? Could God use me to help non-believers find new, found faith in Christ? Could God use me to help believers who are struggling thrive? You shouldn't look at your life and say, how excellent is my past track record? Because excellence in the past is not what qualifies you to be used by God in the future. I'll say it again. The calling of God is not because of our past performance, but in spite of our past performance. With Peter's story, we are learning that even though Peter deconstructed so badly in thought, I'm disqualified. The the dream of I'm being the rock and going to be used by God, that's gone. No, he learned that that's not how God rolls. The grace of God is manifest and not ignoring it, Addressing it and re-receiving your calling to be a world changer. And that's what Christ taught Peter, and that's what he's teaching us. Friends, do you have deconstruction in your life? Do you have failure in your life? Do you have a decline spiritually in your life? You may wonder, ah, I blew it. No. Because of the grace of God, the best is yet to come. There is a power within your life that can cause you to bounce back to glorious levels of spiritual renewal and spiritual impact. Let me share a story with you. It's a story of someone who has made a huge impact in my life, a a professor that I had back at Wheaton College. His name is Dr. Lyle Dorsett. And it's not just my life that was so profoundly impacted by this 
professor, my two brothers as well. Uh, in fact, my brothers, you could argue, even more so. Uh, my uh, Lyle not only taught all three of us at Wheaton College, but Lyle went on to start a church, and my uh, brother Mark was the youth pastor for Lyle's church. And Lyle went on to start a missions agency, and my brother Dave, for 10 years, was a missionary in, in Lyle's agency there. And so this man so profoundly impacted the Griffin boys. But it's an interesting story because it goes back to when Lyle was a high school student. Though he was not raised in a Christian home, he had a radical conversion in high school. Back in high school, he led his parents to Christ. How about that? Back in high school, he started to preach. He was a child preacher. No kidding. Little local churches would invite him to come and preach. And he was being powerfully used by God with a vision to devote his life to world impact as a teenager. But Lyle deconstructed. He went off to college, and in college, he had all these super bright professors compliment his intelligence, saying, wow, are you sharp, but criticizing his faith. They said, oh, it's disappointing to see you're a religious young man. You do know that religious thought is really the crutch of intellectually weak people. And Lyle was moved by the anti-Christian bias of these college professors. So moved, in fact, that he abandoned his Christian faith. He became an agnostic himself, saying, yeah, I don't even know if there is a God. Wouldn't you know, Lyle went on after college to get a master's degree and then a PhD, and he became a college professor. And he became one of those anti Christian, uh, spiritually antagonistic profs telling his students that people of faith are intellectual infants. And he, for 20 years, two decades, was devoted to knocking down the cause of Christ, causing deconstruction in the lives of young people when he had been knocked down and entered deconstruction because of a professor uh, back when he was young. Isn't that a fascinating story? Well, adding a, a, a layer to it, uh, he became an alcoholic, was drinking his life away, and he had one student who was a believer and wouldn't resist or succumb to his spiritual bullying. The student came to him and said, you, you make it sound like you're convinced that people of faith are intellectual infants. And he'd say, that's right. And this young student gave him a book by C.S. Lewis and said, I think you need to read Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, a professor at Oxford and a devout follower of Jesus. And Lyle Dorset read C.S. Lewis's book and was mesmerized by the highly intellectual approach to the Christian faith. Lyle read more Lewis and more Lewis. Every book Lewis wrote, he read. And it moved him. And then it all happened on one night when, or I should say morning, when uh, Lyle Dorset woke up on the side of the road uh, so drunk that he didn't even know how he had gotten to where he was in the car on the side of the road, grabbed another beer and started to drink when he realized, my life is a mess and my only hope is Jesus Christ. And on the side of the road, he cried out and the Lord renewed his spiritual life. Lyle needed to get around a better environment so he wouldn't spiritually be brought down. And he got a job at Wheaton College, my alma mater. But at Wheaton, he calls himself a glorified librarian. They have a collection of the works of C.S. Lewis, and he got the job of managing that collection because he knew C.S. Lewis so well at that point. But he had given up classroom care of students until Wheaton said, Lyle, would you teach a class on Christian history? He had been a history professor in the secular uh, university. And he was like, oh my goodness, I'm being invited back into the classroom, only this time to spiritually care for people. That's what I dreamed of doing back in high school when I was preaching, but I've, I've disqualified myself, he thought. I, I was a drunk. I gave myself to alcohol and fighting against the faith. 
Is it possible for me to go back? Oh, in that moment, I feel the tension, and I am so glad. I am personally indebted to the fact that he decided that God is the God of second chances, that God is a God who will help people rebound, and that the best is yet to come. Because he said yes to that class teaching opportunity, and I was in it. I was one of the first students as he re-engaged in teaching again. And Lyle's classes became the most popular on Wheaton's campus. And he has ministered to thousands of young people, my life being one so profoundly impacted. And I am so greatly indebted. Friends, I don't care. God doesn't care how messed up your past is. He is the God who takes deconstructing people, helps them find faith anew, and brings the best yet in their lives. Are you a fisher of men? Are you a shepherd of sheep? Remember our our mission statement is helping people find God. That's a fisher of men, getting people in the boat of God. And then it's helping people follow God. That's being a shepherd of sheep, helping Christians grow. This is the calling of our church. It is the calling of every Christian in our church to help people far from God come to faith and to help Christians thrive in following Jesus. I pray you are feeling the call of God and that any failure in your life won't cause you to say, oh, I've disqualified myself. You have not. God's going to call you, not because of your past, but in spite of your past. In fact, I'd like to pray for you right now. In fact, as I pray, it may be that this is your bounce back, or this may be the first time you're trusting in Christ. We need a spiritual renewal, all of us do. So let's pray towards that end. Lord, as I pray, I'm aware that here are my friends who are joining us online. Some of them may be turning to you for the very first time. This is their moment of salvation. They're saying, you're the... God of bounce backs. So I'm asking, Jesus, take my life, forgive my sin, and lead me on this day forever. Others of us, this moment is not our salvation, but it's a moment of renewal where we see your grace offered and we long for the best to be ahead. We long to see faith restored and the calling to impact this world for you renewed. Lord, we love that you are the God of the grace bounce back. We pray this in Jesus' name.
is my honor to invite you to celebrate Easter at the Compass Church, any of our five campuses or online, because this year we're gonna be seeing some of the Garfield Park Conservatory. This place is amazing and it is bursting with life, life. That's what our focus will be as we learn together that Jesus Christ went from death to life on Easter. And through his resurrection, we too can see our lives go from spiritual death to life. Friends, Christ has a plan to bring you a level of vitality that will make your life explode in beautiful ways. So make sure you join us this year, Easter at the Compass Church. Thanks for joining us today. We hope you are enjoying this series and will join us next week for the conclusion of Deconstruction, A Doubter's Journey. We want to give a big thank you to those of you who give regularly to the ministries here at The Compass. Your gift allows us to help people here, near, and far find and follow God. See you next time.